this week we've got some interesting questions. Quite a few of them, I'm sure, you have been asking yourself. And this first one, I don't know. I'm going to wing it. Here's the question. What are your thoughts on the future of the music business when AI is advancing to the point of recreating voices and even writing songs in the style of any artist you want? This is a great question. And I'm going to answer this with one answer. The generic is what's going to be hit the hardest, not the creative, not the thinking outside of the box. So let's get into why I think the generic is going to be hit the hardest. And also my fears about them taking famous singers' voices. I do actually know quite a few people involved in this part of the world where they are sampling in voices of incredible singers, famous singers, sampling in tons and tons of songs and recreating things. It is interesting, isn't it? Because on one hand, you're always going to have that argument about natural progression. Because, of course, if there was a period of time when you could not record music, which is pretty much every piece of classical music up until you know the 20th century ever recorded, you would argue that all you could do is notate it. And then, of course, before notation, you just would have had to memorize it. And now, of course, here we are where it's so ridiculously advanced that if you took Paul McCartney's vocals, for instance, and sampled in thousands of different verses and choruses of him singing in different registers, used AI to recreate his voice, you could probably do a pretty darn good job. And one of the fears I think many of us have, myself included, is that we're going to start to see these undiscovered demos by famous people that are going to be tried to be sold for millions and millions of dollars, pounds, euros. It may well happen, but there's going to have to be some backstory. There's going to have to be some stuff. A interesting part of it could be maybe you write an amazing song and you take a singer you want to pitch it to and you load in their voice and you then pitch it to the record company, the manager, the artist themselves and say, here's an idea of what it might sound like if you sung it. So there's some practical good applications for it. Like many people are arguing in AI, in literature and stuff like that, they're saying a lot of things like manuals could be written twice as fast if there are certain repetitive things that could be done. So I suppose the best thing it could be is to use for doing things that are repetitive. If you have a drum beat and you say, I want it to be punk rock, boom, da, 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 boom, da, 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 you know, a la, and then you put in you know, a song or a genre, and it does it quicker for you than maybe you're doing it. Is that cheating? Yeah, it's cheating. But is it saving time? Yes. I suppose here comes the big crunch. If you're going to do it, not necessarily for somebody's voice sound, but if you're going to do it to write generic sounding lyrics, is that then the problem? That it's going to write quick generic sounding lyrics? It could be a mixture of 45 different other people's ideas. Yeah, but isn't the brilliance and the genius of it, the twist that you would come up with that cannot be done by a machine? I don't know. I don't know yet. For me, it seems like the juxtaposition of different styles of twisted thinking is what always got me. When Two-Tone came out in the late 70s, it was Scar. It was very recognizable as being that sound from the late 50s and the 60s of Jamaican, of Caribbean Scar. But it had a twist because it had punk rock stuck into it. It had a working class identity around the Midlands of England, for instance, of the UK. So could you do that with AI? I highly doubt it. What are you going to do? You're going to tell it to record something in, you know, reproduce something cheaper, but have all these aesthetics? I don't think so. I think it needs human beings to do that. So what do I, with all this waffling on, what do I think is going to happen? I think it's going to make the generic easier. It's going to make your average 6415 pop song easier to get to. Are we already tired of that? Yeah, pretty much. I don't hear as much of it anymore but I still hear it. I think the generic is going to be easier to do. And it's up to us as human beings to raise the game, to get away from the average. Am I afraid of it? No, I'm not afraid of it. But do I think that backing track library music might come under a lot of fire? Yeah. Yeah. I think that world of music licensing 
unless they're going for like big name, ACDC, Beatles, Pink Floyd, unless they're going for those kind of bands that have David Bowie, like signature sounds, there's going to be a lot of quick and easy generic versions of tracks. That's what's going to hit, be hit pretty heavily. It's already hit pretty heavily. It's very, very crowded. There are people that make a really good living at that, but nothing like they used to. And now there's every single one of us with, I've got tons of tracks in film and TV, hundreds and hundreds of tracks in film and TV. They don't pay an enormous amount, but they do pay something. That's getting more and more competitive. The most successful ones that I've got are where I co-wrote with a band that has a name and is relatively successful and that are featured as a band in an episode where the singer's voice or the music has something that's individual. But I think as far as the generic is concerned, like, hey, we need a Coldplay sounding track, you know, which we hear on thousands and thousands of TV shows. You're like, you hear like a, you know, here's a guitar line, which is kind of like the edge, but a little softer, a little bit more Coldplay. Maybe there's a piano, there's some ooze in our backgrounds, stuff that any one of us in our sleep could write, and many of us do in our sleep. That stuff's probably going to be hit hard. Is it the end of the world that the the generic stuff is going to be easier and quicker to do? You could argue yes. So you might find a lot of people that have less skill set in that area, but have a good enough ear to choose what they want things to be like, are going to use their ear to recreate music and not have to have any musical skill to either play an instrument or understand any kind of level of musical theory. Not that that necessarily is important, because as all of us know, the greatest songs ever written were written by people who wouldn't know what a 145 is, let alone what a Lydian is or a Mixolydian. Great songs were written by kids and people in their 20s, you know. That's what most pop and rock songs that we love were done. And they were done by people with very naive ideas. They probably knew one scale and one shape for their solos, the first position blue scale. And they knew which notes to bend from the minor third to the major, which notes to choke, you know, a flat five, all of that stuff they knew. I mean, that's so much of the great music. It comes from the blues. One, four, five, throw in a two and a six, and most of the greatest songs fit into that. It's going to, once again, I'm repeating myself, but I don't mind. It's going to hit the generic most of all. How important is pre-production and how long should it last? Pre-production needs to last as long as it needs to to get the song great. If I'm co-writing with people, obviously about to make a record, the pre-production and the songwriting sort of becomes one. We end up doing demos as we're going. And if we're getting a demo right, we end up tracking into it. And that's the song. And many albums I've made started off as the demo turning into the final version. A couple of the biggest songs I ever worked on were done like that. So the sort of pre-production songwriting process can become one. Otherwise, when artists come to me and they've got 10 songs to make for a record, I will sit down with them with an acoustic guitar and go through every single song and get the arrangement right, get the key right. And that can be one song a day. It can be three songs a day. It can be one song over four days. Then I'll go, if they've got a band, and go into the rehearsal room with the band and work with them, with the band the Gallery, who I did a couple of albums with. That was the process. Sitting down, working on the songs on a one-to-one -one situation with the main songwriter or the songwriter and the guitar player, whoever was playing melody ideas and hooks and get it right there, then get it into the rehearsal studio and work on the drum parts and everything. And I think typically on the first album I did with them, I allowed about two weeks, two, five or six day weeks. So 10 or 12 days before making a record. I've had pre-production with Augustana on their second record. Uh, we did about three months of pre-production, going through every single song, bringing the keys down because Dan was singing quite high. We brought the keys down quite considerably. He had a lot of chord changes, so I sat there and simplified the chord changes quite dramatically before we went in and recorded the album. Actually, we worked with the drummer as well during that three months process and worked with the bass player. So it was quite dramatic taking those songs from where they were at, which were already brilliant, and making them better still. That three month process wasn't, you know, eight hours a day for three months, but it was like four or five hours a day, maybe a day off where they were playing a show, but it was a lot of work and I'm very proud of that record. It really is the answer is, it takes as long as it needs to take. And is it important? Yes, it's very, very important, particularly when it comes to working with solo artists, so you've got to hire musicians or bands, because there's a lot more to the song than just, you know, a gridded drum loop. 
You need to get in there and really work with the musicians so they fire on all cylinders at once. All right, the last one's really quick. Is that an Audient analog desk behind you? Yes, it is. It is wonderful. It is the Audient ASP 4816. It is an insane console, and we're very, very blessed to have got it. We'll do a full walkthrough at a different time, but I can tell you we're very, very proud of it. I wanted a console in here. I've got a lot of external mic pre's, so I will be using the mic pre's in this as well, but what I wanted was to keep working in a hybrid fashion. I need to break out, have EQ, it's got a bus compressor on it, all of the things, and have faders, but also have a console that has all the inserts so we can go into all of our external gear. So it's gonna be a combination of using with an external gear while still mixing in a box. That really is our favorite way of working, where we can recall a mix inside the box, but have accessibility to external equipment. Now I could have done that with a you know 16 channel or 24 channel summing amp, but no, I want individual EQ, I want faders on every channel, I want sends for headphones, I want sends to go to effects. There's still something about a console, whether it be using it to print tracks through, or in this case, predominantly using for mixing, that I absolutely love, that I don't think can be beaten. But it's just a matter of taste. You see our live streams. Those are all done live mixing in the box. So you can still work both ways, but I still love my external gear and I love being able to access it. So great question. Thanks everybody for the wonderful questions this week. Please let us know what you think about all these subjects. AI is a big one. So I'd love to know what you think. There's been a lot of talk about it, a lot of fear. Some of it's well-founded, some of it isn't. What is your opinion on AI? Please let us know. And if you've got other questions, please let us know down below. Thanks everyone. So long, farewell, au revoir, au revoir, Todd scenes. ciao, goodbye.